everybody. Uh, hello, Dr. Bernard. Hello. Thank you so much for the possibility to come here and join you and your team here in Washington. I'm really glad. Um, and thank you for your time. So would you uh, introduce yourself and would you tell us, like, who are you and what do you do? Sure. Well, first of all, it's been delightful to have you here in Washington. And for those of you I haven't met, uh, my name is Dr. Neil Barnard, and I run the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine and the Barnard Medical Center. And we're pleased to welcome people from all over the world to come and study with us. And we do research studies. We do educational programs. Uh, it all relates to healthy diets and preventing illness. And then we also have programs promoting ethical issues in research. Yeah, and you are known as a great advocate of a plant-based diet. So why, what makes this diet so special? I have to confess, I wasn't raised on anything like a plant-based diet. I grew up in North Dakota where it was a, a meat-based diet and vegetables were kind of an afterthought. Right. But in research studies, we have found that when people get away from the meats and the cheese and so forth, um, they do so much better. And when they're basing their diets on vegetables and fruits and whole grains and beans, right. these simple healthy foods transform into really wonderful meals but the important thing is that these are foods that can reverse heart disease. They can bring blood pressure down. When people have diabetes, they often get dramatically better. Sometimes the disease even goes away. Right. Now, if you had told me that that was possible back when I was in medical school, I would not have believed it. Um, but we've seen this, and we've put these kinds of diets to the test, and they just have power that other diets don't have. What about autoimmune diseases? Is it helpful as well? I think the new frontier that we're seeing is autoimmune conditions. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis is a classic example. We've been doing a study with people whose joints really hurt mm -hmm. because they've had arthritis in some, in some cases for mm -hmm. many years. And if you were to look in the joint, you see that it's inflamed because antibodies are attacking the joints. Well, it turns out that foods apparently trigger the production of those antibodies and so if you get the bad foods out of the diet yeah. you have a chance of, of the condition improving. We've been putting this to the test and it's been wonderful to see many people improve just amazingly mm. when they change their diets. And how long have you been vegan yourself? I started transitioning in my, my diet when I was in medical school but I have to confess I didn't go, didn't go vegan until I finished my medical training. So that's been now, that was 1984, so All right. work out the math. <laughs> it's been a while. That's a long time. Um, and let me ask you, so here in a um, responsible community, for a physician community for responsible medicine, you're not just helping people, but you're helping animals as well. So uh, I know you do a lot of work to protect animals. So would you tell us what exactly do you do? Yes, um, I think this is a very important area. When I was in medical school, uh, it was common to experiment on dogs. A dog would be put on the table and taped down to the table, and then you would give the dog a variety of medications like norepinephrine to show that the heart speeds up, or propranolol to show that the heart will slow down. But we already knew that the drugs do these things. This was just an educational exercise. So when I was a medical student, I refused to participate in those. Right. Um, and after I started this group, we started promoting better ways of teaching. And I'm happy to tell you that in the United States, mm -hmm. no medical school uh, includes, medic includes animals in the medical curriculum wow. at all. It's all stopped. That's and amazing. the same is true in Canada. And so um, I'm hoping that that will be true worldwide. That's just amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and how often do you see real patients who are getting better on a plant-based diet, patients who are able to reduce their medication or maybe even to discontinue their medication? Yeah. Oh, we see this every single week where people come in. Uh, a typical case would be a person who has type 2 diabetes. Right. And they started out on one oral medication, then maybe they added another, and now they're on insulin and injecting. Yeah. And they had no hope that that could ever change. Okay. But when we modify their diet, get the animal products out, mm -hmm. keep oils low, yeah. and choose the healthy foods, right. their need for medication drops so much, and in some cases they don't need medication at all. And the patients are so empowered. I can imagine. Because on my routinely work, we never see patients getting rid of their medication. Normally, doctor would prescribe more and more and more. So that's just unbelievable what you do here. Well, with diabetes, it's because we're using 
a, a more up-to-date understanding of the condition. The old-fashioned way says you got diabetes because you were eating sugar yeah. or you were eating bread that releases sugar as it digests. And that's not the cause of diabetes. The cause right. of diabetes is the buildup of fat particles inside the muscle and liver cells, and that surprises people. But when fat builds up in the cells, insulin no longer works properly. So right. to the extent that we can get that insulin, uh, that insulin working again, mm -hmm. then you've got a chance of getting rid of the diabetes. Amazing. Yeah. And do you think the well-planned, whole-planned cyst diet will work for everybody, even for small children, for pregnant, for breastfeeding ladies? Oh, yes. There, there is no stage of life where you need to have meat in the diet or need to have milk from a cow in the diet. No, there's no stage of life where you need animal products at all. Um, and a plant-based diet is really the approach for every stage of life. Now, for tiny babies, they should be breastfed. Right. And breastfeeding can continue for a year or sometimes even two years. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when solid foods are added, they would be things like rice cereal and fruit, and there's never a need to bring meat into the diet. When you do, you increase the long-term risks that, that people will have. But it's important to understand what are the elements of a healthy diet, and it's pretty simple. Four healthy food groups, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, um, or when I say beans, I'm going to include lentils and peas in that same category of legumes. So right. fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes. Um, it's important to supplement with vitamin B12. Uh, vitamin B12 is not made by animals, it's not made by plants, it's actually made by bacteria. Um, and before the modern era, when people were not very hygienic, right. um, there was bacteria in the soil, on the plants we might pull out of the soil, on our fingers and our mouths, and some people will imagine that that might have given us the tiny amount of B12 we need. That might be true, but today that those days are gone. And because you need B12 for healthy nerves and healthy blood, it's important to supplement. Right. That's, that sounds just perfect. So what foods should we avoid? Well, I would avoid the meat products, right. and that includes not just beef, but all the red meats, beef and pork and so forth. Mm -hmm. I would avoid chicken products and po all poultry. I would avoid the fish products, so all of the meats are gone. Right. Dairy products are gone, and yes, people get a little bit hooked on cheese. I get rid of that too. Um, and eggs, we would leave those aside. And so those are all the animal products. They're gone. But then beyond that, for maximal health, I go further, and I encourage people not to fry their foods in grease. Right. So we minimize the use of oily foods. Right. Um, and then, of course, there are some foods that are heavily, heavily processed, sugary candies and things like that. Yeah. That's not exactly health food either. So what does that leave? It leaves our friends, the fruits and vegetables and whole grains mm -hmm. and beans, but those are just ingredients. In reality, they can turn into a, a big bowl of porridge for the morning, which you can top with blueberries or, or nuts or whatever you yeah. might, might want to put on top. Um, all the pasta dishes from Italian cuisine, they all work so perfectly. But you might be in Japan where you're going to have sushi. It would be vegetable sushi with cucumbers, not the fish. Um, if it's Latin American cuisine, everyone loves beans and tortillas. Um, you, in Chinese cuisine, it might be tofu and rice. There are a million ways to interpret it, and you can find your own. That sounds just delicious. Mm -hmm. So just um, let me clarify, we're not talking just about simple vegan diet, so we're talking about the whole plant-based diet, and it's not exactly the same. Um, a vegan diet means you're not eating animal products, and that's a good switch. So going vegan is always good. But I would go one step more um, because a vegan diet will also include things, it includes anything that's not from an animal, and, and, so, and some are healthier choices than others. Yeah, exactly. So let me ask, is there any science behind what you're saying, us, or do we consider a whole plant-based diet like kind of alternative medicine? I think many people think of, of uh, a whole food plant-based diet as alternative medicine, but I have to say, when a person has a high cholesterol, they didn't get that because of a deficiency in, in Lipitor mm -hmm. um, or something like that. In, in other words, uh, they got it from food. And so addressing their diet and prescribing a whole food plant-based diet shouldn't be alternative medicine in my view. 
It should be mainstream medicine. That should be where we start. And if a person follows a healthy plant-based diet, but they still have a problem, then you can talk about medication as right. alternative. Of course. So I, yeah. would, I would turn it around. Right now, medicine is mainstream. A diet is alternative. Diet should be mainstream. And medicine should be there as an alternative for people where food didn't, did not get the job done. All right. So I think every doctor should know that, and every doctor should implement it into their practice. And, and more and more are. We had an event last night where we had many, many doctors learning about this, and they come in not really knowing um, how foods will affect the heart or their blood pressure or obesity or diabetes. But when they leave, they're excited because they have, they have something that, that they can use in their practice. Yeah, that's just mm -hmm. a miracle. Let me ask about most common myths. So if we go on a plant-based diet, where we get our calcium from if we're not drinking any milk? So what's going to happen? Well, cows don't make calcium. Calcium is an element in the earth, and it gets into grass from, from, through the roots of the grass. The calcium will enter the, the blade of the grass, and the cow eats it. And that's the only reason that cows have any calcium. Well, we can eat green plants ourselves, hopefully not grass. But if people eat uh, green leafy vegetables that, are, that they might like here, I might yeah. have Brussels sprouts or broccoli or collards or kale. Or, there's so many of them. That's the natural source okay. of calcium. All right, so they shouldn't be worried about their calcium levels if they eat leafy greens. Well, we should have plenty of leafy greens, and yeah. some are better than others. I'm sorry to say that spinach is a little bit of a selfish vegetable. Its absorption of calcium is pretty low, mm -hmm. but for most of the others, it's really very high. What else can we do for our strong bones? Do we need to exercise at all? Yes, ex you give your bones a reason to live, and that means exercise. And getting some sunlight gives you vitamin D, which allows you to absorb calcium. Okay. And can I ask you, what's wrong with dairy? Why should we avoid it? Well, dairy products are part of our culture and for many people. But it really has been a historical mistake. Right. Um, it, milk was devised by nature, if I can put it that way, to nourish a calf. And the, once the calf is big enough to eat um, on his own or her own, then there's no need for even the calf to drink milk. Um, and because it's there to nourish a calf, it is loaded with calories, very high in fat. And the second big nutrient after fat is sugar. Right. Milk is full of lactose sugar. You don't have any need for that at all. And also because uh, it comes from a cow, the cow's estrogens get into the milk as well. Mm. And so if you're drinking milk, you, you're getting all of those things that you don't need. The problem with all this is that when you look at people who consume milk products, they're associated with a lot of problems. They seem to fuel autoimmune conditions, uh, including type 1 diabetes. Um, many people do much better when they get away from, from milk. All right. That sounds just great. Mm -hmm. uh, what about fish? Many people think that fish is very, very healthy, and it's a part of famous Mediterranean diet. Well, fish do have some omega-3, which are the good fats, um, and that's a good thing, except that most of the fat in fish is not omega-3. Most right. of it is a mixture of other kinds of fat. And so a person is eating salmon or some other kind of fat, hoping to get that little omega-3. But they're getting all these other fats, and as time goes on, they find themselves gaining weight and having trouble losing weight because right. of all that fat that they're eating. Plus, fish is loaded with mercury and heavy metals and other things that, that you don't need. Right. What about good fats on a plant-based diet? Where, where are we going to get them from? You know, it's a funny thing. If you, if you pick up a green leafy vegetable, you take a leaf of spinach or some broccoli or something, if you send it to a laboratory, they would tell you that there's actually a little bit of fat in there, mm -hmm. and it's very uh, rich in good fats, proportionately. Mm -hmm. um, by good fats, I'm talking about omega-3s. Mm -hmm. And so if we consume green leafy vegetables, and if they're an abundant part of your diet, you'll get um, healthy omega-3s. Um, there are also omega-3s in many other foods that you could, you could choose. Um, uh, some people will have hemp seeds and chia seeds and all these kinds of things. But my own feeling, really, is that they're a natural part of green vegetables and beans and things right. like that. Okay. Another very, very common concern is iron. Do you think vegans are at risk for iron deficiency? It's a funny thing. There is so much iron in green vegetables, which, by the way, if, if, a, if a person is relying on iron, relying on meat for iron, where did the bull 
or the cow, where the meat came from, where did they get iron? Right. They got it from green vegetables. They got it from grass. Yeah. So when people are eating green vegetables, they get a lot of iron. And as a matter of fact, in research studies, it turns out that vegetarian people following vegetarian and vegan diets actually get more iron, mm -hmm. typically, than meat eaters do. That's surprising to people, but it's true. However, because it's from a plant form, the absorption is not necessarily as high as it would be from meat. Right. That turns out to be a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, if you're low in iron, your body will absorb more of it. If right. you're high in iron, your body will absorb less. And that's important because iron, it's good to have a little. It's not good to have too much. If you're getting too much iron, it's associated with Alzheimer's disease and heart disease. So the body has a great system for saying, wait, you've got too much iron in your blood already. Let's absorb less from the foods that you're eating. Your body can only do that mm -hmm. if it's what we call non-heme iron in plants. Right. So get your green leafy vegetables, you get plenty of iron, and your body will take it from there. That sounds just amazing. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about supplements. What if we eat what we eat and we take just some multivitamins? Would it be the same good for our body? Um, people can take multiple vitamins, but most of the vitamins that are in there, you're getting already from right. your fruits and vegetables and so forth. So I do think you need vitamin B12. Um, and if you're not getting sunlight, you need vitamin D. But apart from that, uh, the vitamins like vitamin C and vitamin K, for example, you're getting from food. All right. So it's better not to rely on vitamins rather than eat a healthy diet. Yes, yes. Although I'm going to make an exception for B12. Exactly. Um, I yeah. think th that works perfectly fine in, uh, yeah. in, a, in a supplement form. And vitamin D, if you live in the tropics, you don't have to worry. But if you live somewhere else, um, northern Europe, where the sun is not as predictable, you might want a vitamin D supplement. Right. A lot of people think that all this typical Western diet disease, like diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, that's all are related to our genes or just to bad luck, or maybe this is just a normal part of our aging. So what do you think? Well, we do see these conditions running through families. Diabetes and heart disease do run through families. And that led some people to think that it's because of DNA. Right. But we don't just give our children DNA, we give them recipes. And we give them tastes for foods and preferences for foods. And that's, uh, for most families, much more decisive than the DNA itself. Right. So we have power to help ourselves. It's not our, our Oh, yes. You could be in a family where everyone has had diabetes. And if you follow a healthy plant-based diet and lace up your shoes and go out for a good run, yeah. you know, and then your likelihood of getting diabetes falls dramatically. Right. Uh, let me ask you the very last question. So what do you think about very popular keto diet and paleo diet? Are they so healthy? Um, every few years there is a new variant of a low carbohydrate diet and the current one is called ketogenic diet. And it really is a mistake because there are many ways to lose weight and the way they say to lose weight is just take out all the fruits and all the grains and the beans and the starchy right. vegetables. And if you don't eat them, you'll be missing so many foods that you're going to lose weight. Well, that's true, but you're also missing the healthy antioxidants that are in those foods. And the foods that are left, if it's meat mm -hmm. and all you're eating is sausage and roast beef and bacon, um, those foods are associated with higher risk of certain forms of cancer, higher risk of heart disease, And in research studies, when we look at cholesterol levels mm -hmm. in people who follow that kind of diet, they very often rise, right. sometimes to a dramatic degree. So it's a risky way to go. Plus, when you look over the long run at, at people, the people who are the thinnest are actually not the people following a ketogenic diet. The people who are the thinnest are the people who have been following healthy vegan diets for the longest period right. of time. So that's what I would encourage people to do. Okay, that sounds really great. So thank you so much for your time, for answering all my questions. Thank you once more again for the possibility to come here to learn from you and all your wonderful team. And I will do my best to spread this vegan message all, all around the world and Russian-speaking people. So thank you, Dr. Bernard. Well, thank you for joining us here in Washington, D.C., and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thanks.